Welcome, everyone, to the High Existence Podcast. I'm here with Eric Dorkinson. He is a uh, writer, entrepreneur, uh, investor. He's the author of uh, one of uh, one of my favorite books of all time, uh, The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. I recommend this so often to so many people because it is so uh, useful and wise, applicable. Uh, it's uh, we've we've actually featured it in the uh, the Stairway to Wisdom here at uh, High Existence, and uh, for very good reason. And uh, a little bit about Naval for anyone who, who doesn't really know who he is. He's a uh, an ultra successful uh, investor. He uh, invested early in Twitter and Uber and about uh, seventy other exits, I believe he has. Um, and uh, so he's done really, really well for himself. Uh, but all of his sort of uh, sort of wisdom and uh, insights that he sort of left scattered around. Uh, what Eric's done is uh, is a major service, uh, and by by collecting all of those, gathering them into one single book that's super accessible and useful and valuable. And uh, so I'm going to be uh, talking to him mostly about that. Uh, but he's also got some uh, some really cool uh, stuff going on of his own. He's sort of taken these ideas and uh, and uh, leveraged his own le- leveraged them uh, for his own career and done really well for himself doing exciting things. So uh, welcome, Eric, and uh, really glad to have you on. Thanks for having me. I'm I'm honored, and uh, thanks for having me here to blush through that whole that whole intro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, it's almost strange, sort of like uh, just doing the intro and just sort of having to sit there while somebody says all these great things about you, but they're all true. So, yeah. <laughs> no, I appreciate you, it. You, uh, so I want Nate, you're probably the best person to tell tell listeners a little bit more about who Duval is because uh, you're much more intimately intimately acquainted with them. Uh, but you also cut down the original draft of this book from about 600 pages down to a much leaner version. So I, I want you to also uh, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, about that choice. Yeah, I mean, the, the very first um, concept for this book was like, hey, I'll throw some like transcripts together, like a couple pretty like quick and dirty kind of thing. It'll be a three month project. And then as soon as I kind of had, you know, I, I just tweeted this idea and Naval retweeted it and a few thousand people were like, oh my God, yes, please do this. And Naval was like, I'm happy to support, you know, here's all, everything you need and uh, to get going. I was like, oh, okay. Like this is, I will now give this like maximum effort. And it, it was just immediate scope creep to like, you know, here's a hundred sources. Here's a million plus words of source material. I'm going to spend three years on this thing. And I, the first version of it that I built was like, it was almost like poor Charlie's almanac. It was like, you know, it was hundreds of pages. It was a comprehensive, like everything that Naval had ever said categorized. And I I went and as part of the process of trying to like publish this book, you know, I haven't written a book before. And um, so I I did like a peer review process and I just gave this a manuscript, an early manuscript to probably 20 friends who were kind of all over the world or, or readers or people who were interested. My mom was on the list, like, you know, everywhere from college students all the way on up. And we got great feedback on certain sections, but almost everyone skipped some piece of it. And there was like this overarching, overarching feeling of like, oh, I feel bad because I gave up um, at some point in this book, even though you told me I could skip around. And I thought that was a really interesting observation. I was like, yeah, man, I don't know that I feel, even if I really enjoyed what I read, I don't feel great about books that I haven't finished. Um, so I, I cut a lot of stuff that was, and when I say cut, I think like another piece of that realization was just like putting it out on the website. Like it doesn't go to waste. It's just only accessible to the people who like finish the core book, really love it and want to go sort of choose their own adventure through more of Naval's ideas. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a whole kind of decision-making process around that, but there, there's, it was a long journey to <laughs> to get to the book you see now. Yeah, well, three years. I mean, it, it, it was worth it. I, I think because it, it's it's you can sort of dip in uh, wherever and mm-hmm. wherever, look. There's something there, and uh, it's really interesting. And, and I mean, Naval himself. I mean, he, he said that he doesn't really read books to completion anymore. Like, or right. use it as sort of a vanity metric. Um, f- full disclosure: I totally use that as a vanity metric. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I I I, yeah. I totally sympathize. You know, you don't have to read a book from front to back. You know, there's you know if there's a section that interests you, you know, go there first and get get what you want, like get what you need. Um, I, I always say, I mean, the, the best. I mean, the best book to read is the, the book that will help you solve your current problem. You know, yeah. you, you know, if if it's the 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 Naval Manac, as it's called, is like separated into wealth and happiness. So, I mean, if you're if you want to focus on either one of those, just you know, go to that section. You don't have to. It'll be perfectly happy, but you could use a few more dollars. You know, just read that. Yeah. One. So it's, it's yeah. There's there's probably not too many people on earth that aren't thinking about either their wealth or their happiness. You know, mm. on, on a daily, weekly, yeah. or monthly basis. Um, so, and and I really think there's so, something in this book that can help 
almost everybody on earth, kind of no matter where you are or what you're working on. It's a very yeah. timeless. Um, and, and that was some of the criteria that I used when I was kind of whittling away at, at what got to stay in the final versions. Like, you know, is this still going to be relevant? Is this relevant to as many people as possible? Is this going to remain relevant for 10 mm-hmm. years, 50 years, a hundred years? So, um, you know, the, the thing that'll tell me this is really successful is, you know, I, I appreciate you recommending it now. I hope you're still recommending it in 10 years. Then I hope, you know, you recommend you buy a copy for your kids or something like that. Yeah. That is the highest compliment I think a book can get is, is getting that kind of like Lindy, like intergenerational timelessness. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I don't see anyone becoming disinterested in wealth and happiness. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've had enough of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and some of the, I mean, Naval says like some of these, these like ancient, uh, ancient problems require ancient solutions, um, yeah. that just kind of keep getting rephrased for the modern world. Um, and you know, we, we're struggling with many of the same things we've been struggling with for a long time. Uh, and, and yeah. you like to think we keep getting better at it. Mm-hmm. Well, you mentioned the, the Lindy effect. And I mean, that's, you know, basically, I mean, if something's been around for a long time, it's odds are it's going to be around for much longer. I mean, you know, and I find, I mean, some of the best books to read are the ones that are thousands of years old. I mean, they consider, I mean, the uh, meditations, Marcus Aurelius. I mean, that's experienced a pretty big resurgence and for good reason. I mean, Seneca, yep. um, all, Art, that, like, all that. Art of War four, is another one. Years. Exactly. Yeah, Book of Five Rings. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And I mean, this one, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be still relevant. Which mm-hmm. is awesome, uh, and there's so much in there. And it's funny, I, I I've noticed like other people, not even really affiliated with Naval or mentioning him, uh, use or mention these same concepts and as part of yeah. their you know their regular everyday speech, which which is pretty pretty cool. I uh, heard a uh, podcast with Alex Ramosi, who's like one of the like uh, really really uh, well known marketers, and like he's this, he's at pretty much at the beginning of his career as opposed to like right now. Mm-hmm. But he mentioned something on a podcast which is. Basically, one of one of the best insights from the book, I think, um, he, he says that, uh, and this is quoting Naval, uh, that uh, desire is a uh, contract that you make with yourself uh, to be unhappy until you get what you want. And uh, I mean, I that's from memory. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's, yeah. it, like I think about that myself all the time. You know, it's it's like, when is that not going to be true? I mean, it's, it's always going to be true. Everyone's going to need to hear that. You know? Yeah. Naval has such a gift for distilling, you know, I mean, it. it on the one hand, there's nothing super, super original about that insight, right? Like that is, that is yeah. fundamental Buddhist wisdom. And he says that himself. On the other yeah. hand, it it is a real skill to compress all of those lessons into six words that you can remember that stick in your head, that guide your decision-making that are, that make sense to so many of us. The first time we hear them, you're like, oh shit, like, yep. Like that solves like a tension or a, a um, an ambiguity that I've carried with me for years. And, and like, I can use that tool to now live my life and make decisions better. Like that, that is an incredible skill. Yeah. It's, it's interesting when you get to the point where you forget where you've heard something or read something, but mm-hmm. it's part of your life that it's just like, like there was something, I mean, I remember years ago, I mean, I think this is Jim Rohn or something. And I've read one book by him years ago, but he said, you can get um, almost anything you want in life, as long as you help enough other people get what they want. And mm. I have no idea where I read that, but it's been sort of a guiding sort of operating principle since then. I mean, I always make it sort of win-win every sort of relationship that I go into, right? Like what's mm-hmm. in them, you know? But, uh, and it's like the whole book that, that you've put together is, is littered with, with that, you know, it's, there's so much in there, which is why I recommend it. You know? It's, yeah. It's great. Thank you. Yeah. No, no, uh, no higher compliment than, than recommending a book. Um, you know, yeah. that, and, and when people gift it like that is that's warm and fuzzies for me. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I appreciate it. No, um, there's, there's a lot to, a lot to go into, uh, <laughs> since we're sort of going down, down books, um, how far have you uh, made it into so at the end? So Naval has like his own recommended reading list. Uh, have mm-hmm. you poured uh, that a little bit yourself? Um, like how far have you, have you gone into his, his sources? Yeah, it's some um, for sure. I have not, like there was a moment in time where I like, I was like, Oh, I'm resolved that I'm going to like read all this stuff. Um, and and I, I sort of stopped myself from that. Cause I realized um you know, I, I learned a lot about Naval. I've spent three years basically like very, very focused on like reading all of his stuff and working through all of this. And it's like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be Naval. Like I want to be me. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. And so while it, like I have done this sort of like semi daisy chain a little bit, um, but like that reading, that recommended reading section is probably, I don't know. What do you think? It's five years of reading, 10 years. Like no, if you actually like took it like a real checklist, right? 
Well, especially uh, if you go back and reread some of them, because I mean, some yeah. books are totally worth a reread. Uh, there's a lot of yeah. in there. He's been a big intellectual influence of mine. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, like I mostly, um, <laughs> I mostly like would read through and be like, oh, good. Like I should put extra weight on that thing that I've already read. Like I've read a lot of Talib, what he talks about. I've read a lot of oh, Feynman. Yeah. I've read a lot of Ridley and Sapiens and Charlie Munger. And so like, I'm kind of mm-hmm. like, okay, like cool. I'm not, um, it, it actually like explains some of why I identify with him so much. I was like, Oh, we have a ton of like shared backlink resources. Um, yeah. I'm more well-read on his kind of like nonfiction stuff than the philosophy and happiness stuff that he talks about. Right. Um, but I definitely like uh, when I pick up those books, like I, I put a lot of credence behind, you know, I know he's done a ton of reading and filtering in that space. Um, so I'm not super far down the daisy chain, but I would say a, a little, a, a fair amount. I am. Um and I, it, it is the same thing here that I actually did with Charlie Munger. Like I picked up poor Charlie's almanac at, I don't know, 21 and love that book, you know, read the other Munger books and then read all the books that he said were influential to him. You know, the, the uh, Walter Isaacson biography of Benjamin Franklin um, influenced by Robert Cialdini, m- more and more of those sort of like basic elementary right. economic uh, economics and psychology texts and you know, that's why one of the first questions I ask people on my podcast is like, who are your heroes? I think it's so, and like, if I say Munger and, you know, Naval and Balaji and Elon, like that tells you a lot about what I value. And then you can take, you look at those people, look at their heroes. It's like, okay, it's Benjamin Franklin. It's, you know, for Charlie Munger, it's his grandfather, who's a judge. Um, uh, you know, for Naval, there's like some entrepreneur heroes and some um, sort of enlightenment heroes or spiritual heroes and um it just sort of get a feel for who those people are and how like all, everything that stems back and you can find you know the the people that you admire learned it from someone right and you can kind of like work closer to those primary sources and really um you know build out this really strong kind of robust foundation of understanding not just re not just understanding what they're telling you but understanding how they understood it in the first place and who they learned it from which is super super valuable Mm-hmm. We well, start seeing like the same names pop up over and over again. Mm-hmm. So it narrows down the list. Like maybe I should, you know, start here. And I mean, reading is like, I mean, we'll talk about leverage, you know, uh, coming up, but reading is like the ultimate, you know, leveraged activity. I mean, you're yeah. from like an entire lifetime of, of people's experience in just a few hours. Uh, there's this guy, Jim Quick, you probably heard of him. He says to me, you can uh, you download decades into dates, you know, it's sort of yeah. like a catchy way of saying it. It's absolutely true. And, yeah. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he was like, uh, uh, in, in reading the best books, I, uh, I, I become a thousand men yet remain myself, you know? So, I mean, it's, it's that type of thing, you know? It's- yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, you hinted at an interesting exercise there, which would probably be to like cross-reference recommendations from all of the people that you admire. You know, I think Munger is like a very much a shared um, sort of resource for like a bunch of people that I admire. And when, when I f- meet somebody through that kind of thread of interest. It's like, oh man, we're like definitely going to get along. Um, yeah. But to hear that, you know, to hear Richard Feynman recommended by everyone yeah. from, you know, Bezos to Musk to, or Andy Grove is not, like, not a lot of people know, but a lot of managers that you know and respect, know and respect Andy Grove. Um, so it, it is just kind of like, you know, seeing those, it, you know, it, it is almost like backlinks of, of you know, sort of source recommendations and uh, you could really stack rank the importance of those. Um, once you kind of start to see those patterns. Mm-hmm. Now, the, uh, like a working relationship I've always loved is like Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett and, uh, like just, they work so well together and like bouncing off each other. Does, yeah. does Naval, like, do you or Naval have that sort of like other half that you sort of like, like a contemporary that you work with like that? Uh, or is it mostly just like, uh, like thousand year old dead guys? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, um, and Naval does in in that uh, Nivi Babak Nivi was his co-founder of AngelList. Um, they wrote most of Venture Hacks uh, together. The, uh, Nivi's name is on most of those posts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Nivi is his kind of like co-host when he Naval does his podcast. A lot of that is like their conversations. And I think they've been in you know a lot of the stuff that they've done together. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for people who don't know, what is AngelList? Oh yeah, sorry. So AngelList is is really becoming like the platform of, of like Silicon Valley in the cloud. Like it is the place that you can go to get a job in a startup. It is the place that you can go to get funding as a startup founder. It's a place, 
Um, so I'm starting a small, a small, like early stage venture fund right now. And it's the platform that I use to manage my fund, bring on investors, allocate capital from it's so, um, it is like the utility behind <laughs> so much of what happens in, um, in the Valley, you know, they help you put together syndicates to, to manage investments. They help, uh, it's just, it is a very long list of subtle innovation that makes all of Silicon Valley tick a little bit smoother. Um, and they had some really, you know, they bought Product Hunt, which is like one of the brands that uh, people might know. They started CoinList and Republic, which are kind of more crypto oriented versions of some of the same gotcha. infrastructure. Um, it's a really, really interesting story. And actually, I, I wrote some of, I did research and create, curated in the same way um, the story of AngelList, like how Naval's life experience led to him founding AngelList, what the early stages of AngelList were like, how it got built into this kind of behemoth that it is, which is a really interesting story involving like lobbyists and regulatory changes and like really strong MVP. I mean, they, the first thing they did was build a, a blog and then they built an email list that was like the MVP of the platform. And then like, it is a really, um, is a true story of kind of like inch by inch innovation and winning and it's turned into a, an incredible business on its own. Um, so th that is on the Navalmanac website. It, it, one of the, one of those things that got cut from the, the 600 page version right. of the book. Yeah. But if you're interested in startups and those kind of founding stories, it is a very good one that I think a lot of people, um, is a little hidden in plain sight from people just cause it's not like a consumer brand, but a lot to learn from that. Uh, you can find yeah. that on the, on the book website. Right on. And we'll, we'll include all of this in the, the show notes too. So, I mean, people listening. Put it in the show notes. <laughs> exactly. Right. That's yep. where you want to go. Uh, lead you right to uh, Naval Mack. Um, and with AngelList, I mean, he has like, he, he's, he's building in public basically. I mean, mm -hmm. doing that and he's sort of exemplifying um, a lot of the, the, the principles and things that he's teaching others. I mean, he's doing exactly as he's saying, I mean, he's yeah. using accountability and specific knowledge and I mean, it's massively leveraged opportunity. I mean, he's doing it, which is yep. pretty cool. He's not like an armchair, armchair philosopher, you know? Yeah. I mean, that was, that was one of the really interesting things, you know, the, he talked about the, he taught the, taught us all the frameworks, like chronologically only in the last few years, really, like after he kind of achieved all the success and, and who knows how clearly he understood them in, in the moment that he was acting it out. Um, but you can see, you know, I've got, I have this whole like, history of Twitter. That was one of the things that I went through for the book. And you can kind of see like these, you know, 2000, like 10 to 2014, he's like very much talking about the process of building the company and sharing new features. And, you know, he's almost doing like customer support on Twitter and, you know, hitting up investors and bringing them on. Um, but when you read that, the story of the company, I mean, specific, you can see exactly the specific knowledge and life experience that he had that led him to start understanding the problem better. Like he had this, um, kind of like somewhat nasty legal dispute with his, between his co-founders and his venture capitalists in one of his first companies. Um, and he ended up kind of like getting screwed, but then taking, they, they took some legal action and they ended up settling and things came about. But like, as a result of that, he got incredibly smart about all of the terms that are involved in a term sheet and the funding mechanisms and sort of like started blogging about the game theory of venture capital. And that's what placed him in this spot to kind of be like, I understand venture capital very well. I don't want to perpetrate the existing sort of, I don't know, tr tropes and like the status quo of the Valley. So how do I like innovate this in a way that is friendly to entrepreneurs, but still, you know, represents us as investors, you know, Naval was 32 when he started his first, um, his, what became, uh, I think it was Hitforge. Um, there was like a incubator that became a venture fund. Um, it, and that was where he did some of his biggest, you know, Uber, Twitter, Postmates, um, kind of investments, but he's still, I mean, he's got a portfolio of hundreds today and still like one of the big sort of successes of his career. Yeah. Yeah. It's only been recently, like within the last couple of years that I've really sort of gotten more interested in investing and stuff like that. I mean, it wasn't too long ago. I mean, I didn't know how to calculate like a price earnings ratio, right? <laughs> That's as it should be actually. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, it, <laughs> it is, uh, I, I just wrote a post um, about like managing attention thresholds and trying to wrap my head around like the opportunity cost of like where you allocate your energy at different yeah. stages of like, you know, as you, as you grow your wealth and it's like investing is 
totally irrelevant probably until you like are at, have at least a hundred thousand dollar net worth like yeah. focus all your energy on increasing your earnings and increasing your savings um because mm-hmm. the, the roi of attention to savings versus the roi of attention to investing and then like somewhere as right. you approach and eclipse like a million bucks it's like oh wow like my money can work way harder than i can and eventually you know if you got 10 or 100 million bucks in the bank it's like well, I, I don't like yeah i couldn't possibly have more money than my money is earning for me um so exactly yeah yeah, it's a very yeah, two, two things. Two things you, you said. One I want to uh, jump on now, and one that I want to circle back <laughs> uh, to is uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll circle back to uh, uh, well, actually, no, I'll, I'll mention investing first. So I'm throwing too much at you, I'm, uh, <laughs> right? There's so much. It's, it's like the the book is like talking. Yeah. Uh, but with the, with investing, I mean, it, it, you're exactly right. I mean, if you don't, yes, there is. You know, there, it is a good idea to start early. You know, put in. You know, money absolutely really consistently. I mean, dollar cost averaging is like the most boring, safest, effective thing you can do. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But at the same time, I mean, you're not like nobody's getting rich investing like fifty dollars a month, right? It only re- compounding really only only really really works once you get into like sort of bigger you know bigger investments and like once you actually are able to put more money in, you know. Well, I, I would. The only caveat there is is that, that it's a blend of variables between amount, like the size of the principal and the time, right? Mm-hmm. You, you absolutely can get rich investing 50 bucks a month. If you have, if you have a 50 year time horizon, you know, the, and that's, that's the story that's of the, like yeah. the $5 million janitor, right. That yeah. like Morgan, Morgan Housel tells. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, nobody's getting rich, you know, in five years, but, yeah. but the, you know, long-term compounding. And one of the things like, it's just so massively counterintuitive to us to remember how that compounding works. Like I keep a compounding table open or near me, like kind of all the time, like keep referencing it. And, you know, I've got like a, a super nerdy poster of um, the Berkshire Hathaway, like price to earnings and market cap uh, chart that my buddy Max Olson put together it like up in my bathroom. It was like, I see a compounding returns chart every day. And like, mm-hmm. I just, you have to work so hard to kind of constantly reinforce the sense that, um, that those like things that are so microscopically like, uh, marginally improved marginal improvements in the near term have such massive like outcomes over the long run. And it's just so easy as like a weak, fallible monkey brain human to like underweight <laughs> the importance of that, like seemingly irrelevant, uh, small positive compounding in the near term. And I just take every effort I can to, to reinforce that. Mm-hmm. Well, I remember even like Daniel Kahneman, he, I mean, he mentions all the time, like he is victim to the same cognitive bias yeah. and things like that, that he's written about, that he studied, that they gave him the, the Nobel prize for, like he, 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 like he's like who he is and he still gets tripped up by it. And, and actually, I mean, we're talking about, or we'll be talking about leverage more in a few minutes. I mean, that is super counterintuitive as well, or yeah. sort of like not obvious. It, it's, it, it takes someone like Naval and, and like you to sort of point out how powerful it actually is and some of the applications, you know? But one thing that you just mentioned that that reminded me as well, uh, uh, actually two things. One, you mentioned Morgan Housel, and that is another uh, excellent book for anyone who hasn't heard of the psychology of money. It's 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 actually another one that we featured on the Stairway to Wisdom. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's just another one. It's really really good. Um, but uh, James Clear, Atomic Habits. Uh, he's like it, it's like the definitive book on habits. Uh, what yep. he says is that you should be much more concerned about your trajectory. Uh, than your current results. So if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing now, but you're not seeing any results, like that's fine. As long as you're just, you, you keep doing it, <laughs> you know, you, yeah. it, it will, it will come. I mean, most people forget. I mean, I think uh, Warren Buffett wasn't a billionaire until like, he was in his sixties or something like that. And mm-hmm. it is uh, this like steep curve upwards, you know? And I guess that's not, not the problem that I have, but you know, people sort of sell the dream of, of like getting rich in the stock market. Like, but it's like, yeah, in 50 years, like you'll be, you know, if you start when you're 25, you'll be 75, you know, you're going to be, you know, stuff in your wheelchair in the back of your Ferrari. Right. <laughs> yeah. You'll, you'll get rich. Like the minute you realize that, uh, you know, your life is over and that you didn't need it to be happy anyway. And you've delayed gratification the whole exactly. time waiting to be something that you didn't need to be. Um, yeah. so yeah. I, and, and every, you know, Naval says it, and I think Morgan says it, like, you know, yeah. there's, there's so much, um, there's so much wisdom around it that is, you know, to, to your point on Kahneman, like just thoroughly ignored, uh, because, yeah. <laughs> because it's hard to swallow or, uh, yeah. yeah it, it, or, or takes constant reminders. 
Yeah, it's not not obvious. And and yeah. sort of like that leads into one of the other things you said a while back. I wanted to circle back to about uh, about you know teaching the things that you're learning. I mean, I I will say that you know when you when you teach something, you get to learn it twice. And I mean, like the best way to learn something is to teach it to someone else. And that was sort of what Naval was doing in those old tweets. Uh, that's mm-hmm. what you're doing when you're writing this book. Um, that's what I'm doing when I write these you know book breakdowns of these books and reviews. Yeah. And stuff like that. I'm still learning this stuff, and I write about it to sort of consolidate. Uh, that information in my own head. And if I can't write about it and if I can't speak about it, then I don't really understand it. And now, I mean, you can, you've written about it and you can speak about it. So you understand it and you're bringing it into your life now. And your, your, your trajectory is, is, is corrected. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's a, uh, it's powerful process to get going as soon as you can, you know, just yeah. learn from the best as soon as you can and just double down. And and I have found that, I mean, I think you probably learned this in, in your own way, or maybe it was, it was intuitive to you, but like the more, um, the more of it I publish, the higher fidelity I learn it to and the higher quality bar mm-hmm. I put on, on like the, you know, I, you can consider the almanac, like a book report on like learning from Naval's life. And, I, you know, if I was just like, I'm going to listen to this podcast and take notes on what I can learn from Naval, um, which is like kind of my default nerd mode. Um, I would have maybe listened to it once or twice and like taken some good notes and been like, okay, like maybe I'll apply these, but maybe I'll just keep learning. The fact that I spent three years doing it and had to like really, really polish it and put my name on. I probably have read this book 20 times in the course, in the course of creating it. I feel like I've built like a mental model of Naval that sits on my shoulder yeah. and I can almost predict what he would think about things that he never has expressed an opinion about. I can feel like I can like they're just, it, it, I, I like almost feel guilty sometimes about how much I've subsumed like some of his ideas into my own and been like, these are my ideas now, which is like how all of us work, frankly. Like we all learned it from somebody else and everything we think yeah. we are is is like from outside of us at some point. Um, but yeah, it, it, and it's, it is rewarding to then see that like show up in my behavior, be like, oh, mm-hmm. like I, I have actually like, this is all the way in. And I think the reason, part of the the way that happens is is because of that really high quality bar and the number of reps that I put into it. But I was only able to get myself to do that by knowing that like I had this cliff of of like p- impending publication, like you know, <laughs> looming in front of me. Yeah. Well, you had that accountability, which is another thing that that Naval yeah. talks about quite a bit. I remember you were on the uh, on Anthony Pompliano's podcast, and and he mentioned that uh, now he's got Naval basically on his shoulders, like you said, uh, yeah. as sort of like he's in his like sort of mental uh, board of directors, you know, yep. right? so sort of making a decision. There's like what would Naval say, you know, and yeah. I mean, read enough books, you study enough people, and you listen to enough you know podcasts, and you have like a group of people that are you know much wiser than than you, than you and I, you know, just telling you. You know where to where to focus. Yeah, I got I got Munger on one shoulder, and Naval on the other, and it's it's just like <laughs> a weird place in my head. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Oh man, oh, Naval left. Or, sorry, you left out uh, a bunch of stuff from the book, uh, as you say. I mean, you cut it down mm-hmm. six hundred pages that it could be to a much more accessible. Uh, what is it now? One hundred and fifty or something. Like Two hundred. Yeah, it's about it's about fifty thousand words. Um, okay. I don't know what that. Uh, the, yeah. yeah, about two two hundred pages of like the sure. book pages, which is you know super variable. Yeah, I read it on my phone. <laughs> and they, oh. Oh. So, <laughs> Probably a thousand pages know. on your phone. I don't know. Right. Oh man, at least. Yeah. Uh but um so he left out a bunch of or you left out a bunch of stuff. Uh what uh what are some of uh, Naval's thoughts on education that, that he left out? Because I'm really interested to to know more about that. Yeah. I, so all, all the stuff it's that available I, on your website anyways. Yeah, all, all the stuff I cut is is on that is on the website, um Navalmanac.com. And like I, you know, Naval is meaningfully more eloquent than I am. So, um, you know, th- there's, there's probably more nuance that I might miss in this recap, but, um, th- the thing that sticks with me as, as the most powerful piece of the education is he, he walks us through this thought experiment of like, imagine that every human being on earth is perfectly educated. You know, there's no law of, there's no law of physics that says we can't all know how to write code or, you know, solder together wires or be hardware engineers. And so like, just I- imagine for a second, what the planet looks like if we all have, you know, master's degrees and practical experience in engineering, robotics, software design, and and we have 7 billion sort of like entrepreneurially minded practical um, engineers. And sort of the way that plays out, at least Naval's projection of is like, we would basically solve all material issues like within a decade. (laughs) Like if we had that amount of brain power and energy 
and in the resources to allocate, like going into that, you know, we, we'd automate a lot of factories. We'd automate a lot of farming. We'd have, you know, meaningfully better transportation. Um, we'd have the kind of physical abundance that we are truly are getting closer to every year, or every decade. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. You know, we have longer lifespans. We have, you know, uh, people are using more energy, which is like a, a much better uh, sort of measurement of poverty than, you know, dollars and cents. Um, and, and, and lifestyle, but it's a really, you know, when, when you think about that and the, what is the benefit of, or what is unlocked with great education, it kind of puts you in it like, yeah, why, why can't we have that? Or why, like, why aren't we better at that? Especially now that we have the internet, right? Like, and then I, I, I kind of turn this into like, you know, it seems relatively obvious to me that over, you know, multiple generations, the single greatest the variable with the largest coefficient in the formula of like humanity's rate of progress is, is education. You know, like the smarter we are and the better we are at self-educating or educating each other. And the the closer we can get to that sort of theoretically perfect educational state, um, you know, the faster we move towards being multiplanetary, the faster we move towards, you know, energy abundance or, uh, you know, food and water abundance and, the closer we can get to um, so many of the things that we, that we aspire to. And I don't know, it's just, it's a real unlock to like, you know, and, and taking, you know, then Elon Musk's kind of like, you know, where is this against the laws of physics? What are the first principles? Mm-hmm. The internet really makes it obvious that that's possible to, to reach that sort of um, level of education and that it's a, you know, a d- distribution and logistics problem. It, it doesn't require any, you know, new science to to distribute education to that many more people. It's just um, it's just logistics, uh, which which I find quite inspiring. And I hope uh, you know more and more people kind of like take up arms against that problem that can help us move closer to it. And I think we're going to see some crazy shit in our lifetimes because yeah. of the the sort of compounding or the um, the feedback loop between you know greater education, a, a, a well a much better educated population, and the rate of progress against some of these technological problems. Yeah, nice Hamlet reference, by the way. Take up arms against <laughs> that, but uh, no, I, I, it's absolutely true. And like I sort of like I I I have this uh, I, something I stole from Colin Wilson, one of my favorite philosophers. He he sort of uh, likens uh, humanity in general to like uh, or pe- individual people um, to like big like great big uh, jet engines, basically only only flying on one or jet airplanes only flying on an engine, and there's. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're not operating nearly to their full capacity and like what they what they could become in, in all areas, not just product productivity for the sake of you know productivity, but just uh, yeah. Yeah. just being like fully you know fully here, fully here and now. You know, and I, I mean, I think too. I mean, you mentioned how like the, the material progress that uh, that everyone like all over the world. And uh, I mean, Steven Pinker, one of my favorite uh, authors, like he's re- written several books books on how everything is pretty much getting better all the time <laughs> yeah yeah hell yeah things he uh he, he the way he puts it is that like they newspapers if they were going to um, um accurately tell people tell people accurately the state of the world they could have uh, ran the headline of uh, twenty five thousand people uh lifted from poverty today um every yeah. single day for the last like however many years like 50 years or something like that you know which is really astounding and like when you yeah. you know I, I don't know the exact number but the number of uh of people with like a, a genius IQ per like in the population, mm-hmm. uh, how many in the bottom billion uh, just aren't being able, aren't being given the opportunities to develop their full intelligence and really sort of like, we need to add their intelligence to our own and sort of bring them up and sort of help, uh, help us solve like our collective problems. Right. And we're, and yeah. I mean, we, them, we have you know. generations of lost Einsteins that I hope are, are, um, you know, no, no longer lost. And we see people yeah. working on this problem. I mean, Andela is doing this, um, with incredible results. I think is their focus on Africa. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that's like their tagline, you know, intelligence is equally distributed opportunity is not, and um, it's something biology has, has worked on as well uh, with, you know, 1729 and things like that. This kind of like global spotlight search for, you know, uh, uncommon intelligence and making sure that those people get the, the resources and attention and, um, you know, problems that they need to like, you know, you never know who's going to invent the next, you know, the next steel or Bitcoin or whatever. And, and okay. those are... Um, you know, th- those people make deeply disproportionate contributions to 
the, the comfort and safety of the rest of humanity. And we should all be interested in um, finding and resourcing and supporting them. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I mean, I, absolutely. And I, I think, I mean, sort of slaving away to sort of just to just survive, it, it, they're not, you know, it's not, they're not like real human problems, you know, like they're not problems like like worthy of like a fully dignified human being. You know what I mean? Like you should be able to, to work on more interesting problems, you know, than just worrying about how to survive, you know? Yeah. And, right. I mean, the internet's changed everything. And I don't think people, even now, I think, you know, we're still early in the internet. I mean, we're we yeah. anything yet, you know, and it's just like the, the potential that just lies there undiscovered, which is really astounding. And it's sort of, it's, it's, it's not obvious, you know, which sort mm-hmm. of, like, you know, makes me wonder like how many people are actually aware of this potential as opposed to like how many people I'm aware of it. You yeah. Know? I mean, we, we've been saying it for, I mean, d- 20 years now and it still feels like both eye rollingly obvious and like we're still underestimating it. I feel like we're, we're constantly yeah. underestimating software innovation. We're still underestimating the impacts mm-hmm. of the internet. You know, we're not done with the like um, dig- digital transformations. We're not done with, you know, even, even spreadsheets becoming SaaS. We're not done. And, mm-hmm. and the fact that like, you know, blockchains are, I mean, the, barely distributed, let alone really even finish being developed. You know, we've, that's going to be another drive, another 20 to 50 years of innovation. It's going to take us 50 years to figure out what, you know, all of the second and third order effects that, um, that that'll have. There's, um, yeah, there's, there's just so much exciting stuff going on. It's so easy to underestimate it uh, yeah. kind of constantly. Yeah, they, we're pretty much always doing it all the time, and you know, like, it's, it's hard to go about your life just having your mind blown all the time. You know, oh my god, <laughs> yeah. twenty five thousand more people leaving poverty. Oh my god, like we're living in the age of ultimate innovation, and exactly, we sell ourselves short, you know, so often. And, and one of the things, I mean, one of the senses I loved in, in the involvement act was uh, he's, and I, I forget exactly where this appears, but he says, "What if this life were the paradise we were promised, and we're just squandering it?" You know, I've always yeah. loved that. That's that's one of my favorites, and. Yeah. Speak okay. So speaking about like common knowledge and everything, like how how common do you think is knowledge about leverage? I, I don't think very often. I mean, you ask the normal everyday person, like describe, like give examples of leverage. I don't think they most people would be able to do it, or, or at least like in a compelling way. Uh, now, how would you describe it, and and uh, how common do you think is that uh, is that knowledge? Yeah, I, I think. Um... I think it's common under some different names, right? Like there are some like kind of, especially in business, there's like some almost folk sayings that are like, mm-hmm. that allude to, to it. Um, yeah. you know, it takes, it takes money to basically. make money. Yeah. Sure. Your money can work harder than you can. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the old like E-Myth revisited thing is like, you know, work, mm-hmm. work on your business, not in your business. Like yep. all of these things are kind of like um, alluding to leverage. And I, I think the word leverage is um, sometimes kind of trips people up because they either think like, Oh, they, they go straight to like wall street financial leverage. Um, Mm -hmm. or they think like, Oh, to have like power over someone in a negotiation, like that kind of leverage. And this is really neither. This is, this is like, um, an expansion of the simple machine. Like it is the mental modification of the simple machine, a lever that simply lets you lift more, you know, a lever arm that lets you lift more than you could with direct effort. Um, so I can't lift 800 pounds yet, but I'm going to keep trying, but with the 20 foot lever, that's no problem at all. Um, and you know, if you had a 20 mile lever, you could lift the Eiffel tower. And, um, if you had a 20 light year lever, you could lift the earth, right? Like Mm -hmm. this is where leverage and compounding are so similar in that they are very counterintuitive. They're very math based. They can utterly determine, you know, the, the outcome of your life or explain the extreme outcomes that we're seeing it once you kind of have this understanding, but it's so hard to believe that, you know, $50 a month saved today will let you retire a millionaire in, in 40 years. And it's in the same way, it's so hard to believe that you can look at a building and say, I could lift that, you know, with a, with a 200 foot lever. Um, it just doesn't seem possible. And when you see really long levers, like, with comedically small things, you're kind of like, that's incredible. Um, and in the same way, you know, you watch Warren Buffett make one decision or, or Naval, you know, invest, make one, take one, one hour meeting, you know, write a $10,000 check. And a few years later, collect a million dollars, like that's leverage. Um, and it seems impossible 
<laughs> or illegal, depending on your, <laughs> depending on your like worldview until you understand, you know, the, the compounding and the stuff that comes behind it. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting mental model. And it was, it was the thing I would left the book with the most curiosity about. Um, it, it's the thing I get the most questions about too. You know, like there's yeah. a chapter on leverage. People read that chapter and they're kind of like, I want to read a whole book on this concept. Um, like where can I go to get more? And I had no resources for them. Uh, I just kind of, I had the same hunger for it and I started reading and collecting and, you know, trying to find things and trying to kind of expand frameworks and find resources and, and case studies and stuff like that. And, and that's what turned into the leverage course, but it really started with me just trying to like figure out how to apply this for myself and mm-hmm. um, sort of, you know, get this idea even deeper into my head so that it would become sort of a second nature instinct for me and, and guide more of my decisions. Mm-hmm. Now you and Naval talk about four different types of leverage. Do you want to just uh, say a few words about each one? Yeah. Um, so, so we have uh, tool, tool leverage, product leverage, people leverage, and capital leverage. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, tool tool is pretty simple. Like try to chop down a tree with your bare hands. You're going to have a bad time. Use an axe; it's going to go way better. Use a chainsaw; it's going to go even better. Um, product, uh, Naval calls it media leverage. I think product is yeah. is a little bit broader, but potentially um, a little more confusing. Fair, which is fair feedback. Um, we're creating media leverage right now. We're spending you know an hour, hour and a half to record this podcast. It will serve you know thousands of people in parallel and well into the future, totally on demand. Um, I like to think of that like creating a like little digital clone of us um, with like a purpose built uh, a specific purpose that also incorporates uh, media also incorporates, um, you know, writing blog posts, writing books, um, even writing algorithms, software. Um, There's a little bit of a fine line between like what's media and what's a tool. Like I think Zapier is the tool, but the the formula to to decode in Zapier is, Mm -hmm. is the media, like the knowledge process that you're actually using that tool to, to describe and act on. Um, okay. The third being, uh, people leverage. Um, so that, you know, the first thing that people think of is employees, true, great also includes, um, you know, freelancers, agencies, um, I think also includes audience and fans. So not all of it has to be like, Oh, people you're paying, but friends, experts, mentors. Um, and again, like there is no negative connotation to leverage. We are all somebody else's leverage, uh, you know, in, in, we are all benefiting from trading each other leverage. We are good at different stuff, you know, very like econ 101 um, benefits from trade outlook in, in this sort of um, context. And then the fourth is capital leverage. Um, so money being the most obvious thing that you can, you know, invest directly or use to trade for any of the other forms of leverage. Um, but you can also look at it like, you know, your, your car or your spare bedroom or capital of, of some form and you can, you know, monetize those or lend them or, you know, give your spare bedroom to somebody who, you know, can help you work. Uh, like there's just so many things you can do when you have a creative outlook and you sort of take full inventory of, of those types of leverage. Um, and, and something that I noticed just like a pattern going through these and, and talking, I mean, I've had hundreds of these conversations with people in the course and, and in podcasts and, and friends and almost everybody sort of inherently is drawn towards or has skill with, you know, one or two forms of leverage. They're usually like totally blind to like, they don't even consider one of the four forms. And there's an, there's another one that they, they want to use, but they don't know how, or they're afraid to. Right. So maybe somebody's an amazing manager, um, but they just don't understand how money works at all. They're terrified to spend any money on better tools or on other people. And they just like that's a missing piece or, or vice versa. Um, you know, they're a really like tool oriented person, but they never want to manage anybody. They don't have business partners. Like we talked about, you know, they don't have a, a monger, um, or mm-hmm. a Nivy. And, uh, yeah. and, and usually like there's some combination of things that you can, you can really unlock a ton of growth when you, when you look at all four of those and really give yourself an honest sort of, um, brick by brick, like, path towards building all of them out. Um, and, and that's what we do in the course, you know, that's, that's what all the frameworks and tools and, um, exercises are kind of oriented around. Mm-hmm. It's almost overwhelming once you start learning about it and you sort of like, yeah. like a fireworks display, <laughs> when you think about all the ways you could, you know, gain these types of leverage and apply them and make so many different areas of areas of your life better. And the compounding effect of making your life better. Like, yeah improving your experience for every subsequent moment of your life. You know, if you improve it now, 
You know, it's, yep. it's just the, the, the possibilities are, are, are almost endless. And I know for me, I mean, it, it's people leverage that is the one that I'm sort of not reluctant to go all in on, but uh, sort of, um, I guess, missing. Uh, mm-hmm. There's an excellent book um, uh, called Who Not How by Dan Sullivan and Benjamin Hardy. And it's all about, you know, basically the core idea is that there are people that that love to do what you hate to do or are yep. infinitely better at doing things that you're just sort of okay with. And you're much better served hiring those people to do those things and freeing up your own time to work on your own core competencies and uh, as opposed to trying to do everything yourself. And like when you have that sort of people leverage. uh, So like right now I'm hiring other people to like do the things that I'm like not all that great at, (laughs) you know? Yeah. 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 Naval has this thing too. I mean, he, uh, what's what's pretty cool how he uh, uh, values his time at hundred dollars a minute. And mm-hmm. I've like that stuck with me since I first heard it. And like, if it's, if it's something that he can pay someone to do, uh, then he'll, he'll do it. Like if it costs less than a hundred dollars a minute, like he'll, he'll just, you know, delegate it. And uh, I remember him, him saying that like he did that way before that was literally true, you know, way before his time was actually worth that much. Uh, it was a, more of a mindset shift and that sort of opened up, you know, more for him, you know? Yeah, that, that's one of the first. Um, it's one of the first exercises we do in the course, and people people struggle with it because it's very difficult to. Um, it's difficult to believe that your time is worth you know a thousand dollars an hour. You're like, if that were true, why aren't people paying me a thousand dollars an hour? Or like, if that's true, why can't I spend two hundred dollars an hour on you know this this person to help? And it's kind of like you you can, if you are then recycling your time into that work and like, there's a lot of variables that go into it, but it's an incredibly valuable um, way. To, it gets you to start valuing your time, thinking about how you're investing your time, um, but both your working time and your leisure time. Right. So like, you know, the, it is not to say like, you should always be focused on work to the maximum extent possible. You should always be maximizing like the hourly rate that you have, but it is to say like, you have to value every minute that you have, whether you are choosing to work with that time or choosing to relax with that time. Um, you know, putting a high dollar value on it helps you helps make tangible that it's really the, you know, your time is the denominator of everything. Um, it, it is the ultimate resource that you have. And the art of leverage is really, it's about increasing your impact, but that is impact over time. Like that's the denominator. You want to, you want to live a good life. You want to achieve the things you want to achieve. You want to, have the enjoyable subjective, you know, internal experiences that you want and leverage is sort of the art of, of, um, getting what you want out of all those things and arranging your life so that, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're spending it the way you want to and having the outcomes that you want. Yeah. To my knowledge, Naval hasn't been able to find a way to like get any of his time back that he's wasted. And like, <laughs> you know, that would be great. I mean, if you could show how to do that, maybe your next book or something, but Man, it's pretty impossible. Like once you spend it, it's gone forever. Like you better use it well now. Yeah. And I mean, and forgiving yourself for that. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but there's no better time to learn than now, you know, for, for starting to get a feel for, um, yeah, what, what, what your time is worth and how you want to spend it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it is that the byproduct of making me slightly impatient with, uh, some of the particularly <laughs> annoying things in life. Yeah. And, and there, there's funny, honestly, there's really funny stories about Naval and that I can't remember um, if, if any of them made it in the final book or not, but there's like, there's some story about him being, um, a, a, I think he says like a very unique combination of willful and impatient. And he's like, I am notorious for like, I'll be at a dinner party. I will decide that this is a waste of my time and I don't want to be here. And without saying anything, I will just get up and leave because it's my life and my time and I'll do what I want. And like, yeah. is that outrageously rude by common standards like yes uh i think by all accounts yes but like it is also a, like there's no better proof that he's like somewhat it just has a super unique outlook and perspective on like what it means to really own to, to be responsible for your own lived experience and be willing to take whatever actions you want to to kind of like make that the best thing you can yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's your time and it's your life. I mean, time is what your life is made of. And mm-hmm. yes, I mean, don't be a jerk. <laughs> you know, I try yeah, yeah. to be a jerk. I try to be friendly to people, but yeah. you know, like you don't owe them a piece of your life, you know? And, and right. I mean, like, I, I try to answer all my emails or, or comments to like posts or whatever, but you know, they're basically like, like email is, is people reaching into your schedule in your life demanding yeah. something from you. And <laughs> It's, it's they don't always have permit like they don't have permission to do that or cart cart mm-hmm. to do that right 
So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, when you're, when you're raised as, as uh, polite as, as it sounds like we were, you know, that, that <laughs> there, there's something like, it, it's like extends the neighborly feeling of like, no, of course I'm here to help to like, mm-hmm. I, I totally stand by that, but also there's a hundred of those in my inbox and like there's only 24 hours in the day and that's yeah. just a hard thing to swallow and, and mm-hmm. get a perspective shift on. Um, but that's also where leverage comes in, right? Like the, that problem is also the solution where you're like, I cannot spend an hour on the phone, you know, on a call with everybody, whoever wants to, as much as I might want to. Um, but I can record, you know, hours and hours, hundreds of hours, more hours than you want to listen to of me talking about whatever you want to talk to. And I will put it out there and like make it self-serve and I will do the best I can to um, share what I've learned with, with as many people as I possibly can. And, and yeah. you know, that may not always take a one-to-one form, but um, you know, I hope it's still perceived as generous and comes off as useful. Right. And I feel like that's the same thing you're doing here too. Yeah. And it's sort of, it's also made me sort of uh, more patient and more understanding with people mm-hmm. busy for me, you know I mean? Yeah. Like there have been podcast guests that have been like, sorry, I, I just, I can't make it. And, you know, I, I don't think I ever would have like been upset with that. Like it's, you know, shit happens, but it's, it helped. It still helps to realize that, you know, it's, I'm trying to claim some of their time and like, it's, they're allowed to say, no, it's not like a, it's not an indictment of me, you know, necessarily <laughs> just like, you know, sorry, it's, it's their life. It's yeah. wild out there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it's right? crazy. Yeah. 24 hours in a day. Yeah. Now, so what would you, like, if someone were to come to you one-on-one and ask, like, like, how do I spot leverage points in my life? How do I sort of develop an eye for it? Um, where do you sort of, like, complete beginner, where do you start looking for leverage? What's What's your first move? Yeah. I mean, the first, the first thing is mindset. So, you know, you kind of talk through some of the things that, um, you know, how are they valuing their time? The, the opportunity is low hanging fruit. You talk through like, what are the things that you do the most often? Um, what are the super repetitive tasks that you deal with? Um, what, what are the biggest opportunities that you see? What is something that you know, you should be working on that you're not, uh, you know, to your point earlier, like what's something that you're doing that like you hate to do that like, it's not all like, you know, um, down to the minutes. It's also down to kind of like energy management. Uh, you know, like there's stuff that I just have no patience for that, like outsourcing it, even though it only saves me, you know, 10 minutes, it saves me an hour of like mental angst about how I spend that 10 minutes. Um, which is like one of those, like it's totally intangible, but real things. Um, I, I think it's really important to when you're just starting to kind of like get your head around this, it's it's important to like take baby steps and start to feel the tailwind um of leverage working for you. So like very, very early in our course, I think it's like the the second lesson, even um right after welcome, it's like go do something immediately. I don't care how small it is, but like set up one Zapier automation, um, you know, put a hundred bucks into, you know, into like Coinbase and set it to like have a, a staking yield on it and watch, you know, the thousandth decimal place, like click over every second and just like start to get a feel for the fact that something is working for you while you sleep. Cause if you've never felt that before, it is really, it's hard to believe it's there. It, it, it's kind of, it's the same as the compounding. Like it's hard to believe that, you know, that one cent of interest every month matters or whatever. Um, but you want to start that feedback loop of like, I spent an hour to do this. It saved me 20 minutes this week. And by the end of the month, I start to feel really good about that. And as soon as I watch that automation run, I feel great. Or as soon as I watch that capital return, I feel great. Or, you know, outsource one task on Fiverr. It's it's it'll take you, it'll take you five minutes to post it. You'll get a bunch of stuff. Like start really small and start practical immediately. Um you know, one of the, one of the bigger exercises we do is, is sort of like doing an inventory of all the leverage that you have. Um, so this, this Mm -hmm. comes a little later, but it's, it's, it's one of the big aha moments. It's kind of like doing a map of your current leverage. Um, and so we do, you know, your tools, your products, your people, and your capital, um, what do you have available to you? What's, what's currently deployed, like actively working, you know, what's, Mm -hmm. what's available, but not yet sort of engaged and then where you want to be in the future. And I do this exercise quarterly just looking at what's out there and it's like, Oh, I've got, you know, um, it, it's, it's almost a way to calculate your net leverage. You're like, I got 30 podcast episodes out there. 
Um, and so I've got, you know, 30 little digital clones who are working in these specific purposes. I've got this standard operating procedure and like, this is something my EA is running. And I've got this, like, you can kind of look at this mountain, it, the course is called building a mountain of leverage. And you can watch these new, um, you know, I, that's how I think of my work. I think of it like adding new levers and extending the levers that are already there. And every quarter there's like this, you know, reminder process to like, look at your life this way and, reorient your work towards either adding new levers or extending the levers that are there. And in this way, like whatever you do, you know that your work this quarter is setting you up to have a bigger quarter, the quarter after and a bigger quarter, the quarter after that, and a bigger quarter, the quarter after that. And you avoid as much of the work as you can. That is, you know, one in one out, I'll have to do this the exact same way another time in the future. And you see the really, really great businesses, um, or, or even the really successful individual people who, you know, you, you can sort of dissect their career using this framework and you can just watch the leverage it sort of built and added and built and added and grown and compounded until, you know, they're on this mountain of leverage. I think, you know, um, I think Oprah is an incredible example. I think Joe Rogan's a great example. I think the, um, uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines are a great example. Like um, you can look at Elon Musk's career this way. You can look at Warren Buffett's career this way. You can break all these things down. Like what are the types of leverage that they use? Um, how did they come about? How, who did they hire? Who do they have around them? Uh, you, you could re- like one of the places this clicked actually was um, reading the back of the acknowledgments in Ray Dalio's first book, Principles. So you know you read Principles, excellent book. Yeah. Excellent book. Yeah. I read reading it, his yeah, new lot. one right now. It's so good. Yeah. It, yeah. Um, it, you know, there's one name on the front of the book and you're like, wow, Ray Dalio is an incredible talent. And then you read the acknowledgements in the back of the book and there's 60 names. There's like, I'd like to thank my three personal assistants. I'd like to yeah. thank, he literally has people working for him who are called raised leveragers distinct from his personal assistants. And they, mm-hmm. and then, you know, I'd like to thank the people that head up my teams and manage my funds. And like, you know, no one who is achieving the superhuman is doing it alone. And if you, if you really like start to try to look at the mountain that they're standing on and, and the leverage that they've built around them, um, you can see an incredible amount of this and you'll start to like, it gives you x-ray vision a little bit and you start to like see the blueprints of these businesses and these success stories. And you're kind of like, Oh, I understand how this comes together. Yeah. And like that's, we do a lot of that in the course, just trying to break that stuff down and understand how it happens. Mm-hmm. It's it's an iceberg. I mean, the top of the iceberg ab- above water is the person, but then ninety percent of it is like the everything. exactly, right. exactly. Like I and never. That- Sorry, every <laughs> every biography like that you read after you put this idea in your head, like I'm now like jotting in the margins. I'm like, oh, this was tool leverage. Like I, I just read um, Arnold Schwarzenegger's, which I really really liked. Oh, yeah. He's an amazing yeah. example because he just started from absolute yeah. zero, right? Yeah. I love the title of his autobiography. Total, recall. yeah, Total Recall. <laughs> yeah, amazing, like right on. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, like I, I never skip the acknowledgments. And actually, I, I uh, one of the uh, one of the notes that I took from uh, the the almanac. Uh, was uh, was from your acknowledgments, and I thought this was pretty funny. Uh, funny enough to mention here, uh, he's, you you say uh, you're all wonderful friends who became extremely helpful advisors to me throughout this book building and publishing process. Without you, I'd still be googling things and mumbling curses. <laughs> 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 I thought that was pretty funny and like oh, pretty true, right? True, man, dude. Publishing a book is hard. There's a bunch of you know, there's yeah. a bunch of stuff that you don't know how to do, and uh, it is really really helpful to have somebody who's been through this, just spend 20 minutes answering your, your stupid questions that, you know, takes six hours to Google, uh, Mm -hmm. Google up an answer. And even then you're not sure if you believe it. Um, (laughs) And I, you know, I owe a lot to, to the people, you know, back there. I mean, Emily Holdman was one, James Clear was another um, who were just like uh, Max Olson, who did the the letters of Warren Buffett is is a friend and like inspiration for me in creating this and super, super helpful in, you know, I don't know, like clearing, macheteing aside the brush of book publishing and being like, yeah, come on, here's the way you can, you can do it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like, there's a path through the, through the woods here. You can do it. Yeah. One of the things I've always, uh, like I, I, I heard this uh, speech by Will Smith like years ago and uh, he says the two keys to life are running and reading. And uh, he mm-hmm. said reading is one of the keys to life because there are no new problems. Like any problem that you're facing or challenge you're experiencing, there's someone else who has already faced that problem, solved it, gone a little bit of the way towards solving it and written about it in a book that you can read in a few hours and then apply it immediately uh, to solve whatever problem it is. You know, yeah. that, you know, there are people who have done it before there, are, you know, there are 
who like out there, like who else can, can do this for me that, so I don't have to, so I can free up my time to do what I do best, you know? Yeah. I, I, it seems like every great, you know, every, every wise person that I've listened to has some version of that, you know, Charlie, Charlie yeah. Munger's like, you know, make friends among the eminent dead and Naval's like, you know, ancient yeah. problems require ancient solutions. And yeah. yeah, there's just a lot of, um, yeah, there's a lot of value in those books, man. Um, yeah, totally. It sort of, it, it, it leads into uh, one other thing and uh, we'll sort of, we'll wrap this up a little bit because I uh, want to sort of respect your time a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> Value it at a thousand dollars a minute. Um, you'll get, it, and, you'll get uh, an invoice later. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. Okay. Um, and uh, specific knowledge. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like that is one of the, the key ideas from, from this book that uh, it's, I don't think a whole lot of people understand, but they, they should and they easily could. Uh, so maybe just a few minutes about what specific knowledge is and how, um, how it ties into leverage. Yeah. I, I mean, I love, um, I love how prominent specific knowledge is in Naval's frameworks. Uh, and I, I find it liberating for myself. And I think for a lot of other people, cause you, it's, it's really easy to spend. Um, I think the default mode for a lot of analytical people, uh, especially is I want an outcome. Let me look at who achieved that outcome and follow their path. You know, you want to be rich, study Buffett, become a value investor, do this. And it, it like may or may not actually stem from your innate skills, interests, and talents at all. And one guaranteed way to fail is to try to like kind of become someone else and try to follow a path that worked for them because of who they are and what they're interested in and what they love to do. Um, if you hate the gym, but you want to be a, rock, a like famous movie star, like do not try to do it the way the rock did. Cause it's not going to work for you. Um, so it really, I, I appreciate that uh, through all the frameworks, it really starts with with specific knowledge and specific knowledge to uh, loosely define is just is that combination of your inherent skills, abilities, and talents. Um, you know, Naval says some of it is genetic, some of it is is nature, and nur- some of it is nurture, and some of it is just kind of the experiences that you have happened to have in life. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, whether those were intentional or not, like whether they were good or bad or not, like, you know, the impetus that got Naval to start Angelus was actually like, as he was going through it, I think one of the hardest times of his life and one of the most shitty unfair things that ever happened, but it gave him that experience and, you know, the scars and the perspective and the, the hard earned wisdom to go and start this company. Um, so, you know, it, it's, and that is not to say like, if you haven't walked some specific path, you know, you're, you're screwed. Like everyone has a specific knowledge. Um, it is just your task to figure out what that is. And you see somebody like, you know, Jocko Willink or whatever, like using his very specific walk path. That was another one where it's like his, the stories of what happened is his career are actually really tragic and sad. Um, but he has turned that into, you know, lessons well-learned and things that he can teach other people. I shouldn't use all like creators or whatever, you know, as an example in this, um, who's another jo- Josh Wolf is an investor. Who's like, who's like a good example of, um, you know, sort of he was deeply interested in new technologies and sci-fi stuff and like became a very unique kind of frontier venture capitalist. Um, he didn't try to build, you know, Sequoia or Andreessen Horowitz. Cause that's not, you know, that wasn't the set of opportunities and skills available to him. So, um, you know, Naval talked about like, you know, how to, and, and I get questions too, like how do you develop your specific knowledge and you can do it an amount of reflection and journaling and try to figure out sort of, um, you know, some of the questions that are helpful here is like, what do people come ask you for help with all the time? Yeah. The people around you are maybe better at recognizing it than you are. Like ask your friends, ask your parents, you know, what are the things that you did as a kid? Like yeah. very naturally, like, you know, what's I was your just specific, when I, what's your specific knowledge? Uh, it's a a question that is very fair and that I wish I had a better answer to. Um, let me talk through it a little bit. So I have, um, as a kid, I was always like creating and writing. So I like have little books that I like would staple together and I would like write comic books and write books. Um, when I was a little kid, so I've always been a reader and a writer. Um, you know, we, we grew up in a very like small business household. So I was getting paid. Like I was, I was like selling candy out of my locker. Cause I found I could like buy a pack of airheads at Costco for like five cents an airhead and sell them at school for 50 cents an airhead. Um, you know, I got paid to give kids rides to school and high school and in college, I was building websites for companies. So it was just like kind of constantly like entrepreneurial and mildly creative. And then I spent 10 years in um, the tech world and, you know, six living in San Francisco. And I was around a lot of, um, you know, a lot of my friends sort of became, 
technology founders and early stage employees and investors. And that is like a world that I really love because it's kind of the mix of entrepreneurship and sci-fi and what the future might look like and really like applying technology to deploy it to create change in people's actual life. And so um, that is like the combination of all my skills and interests. And it's kind of, I don't know, my job is sort of job, quote unquote, is sort of like organically developing at the moment. And it is becoming some mix of like, you know, writer and curator and researcher and investor and, you know, teacher and whatever else sort of emerges here. Um, That's exciting. It's always the process of becoming, you know, I, I like that. Yeah, I, I'm trying to kind of create some space in my life to like let that organically emerge um, rather than like be in too much of a hurry to like redefine, um, you know, my career, uh, you know, through the same mistake I outlined before of, of just kind of like choosing something to work for somebody else that looks looks cool on them mm-hmm. and being like, yeah, I'll just take that off the mannequin and put it on. Like I'm yeah. trying to weave my, weave my own cloth a little bit. Yeah. One of the things Deval says in, in the book is, uh, you know, most of life is a search for who and what needs you the most, you know, which is a good lens to to approach it in. You know, like there's so many, uh, again, I mean, so many opportunities, but you just have to sort yeah. of for them and you sort of make the path by walking, which it sounds like is what you're doing, you know, which is exciting and just it's it's totally open, which is yeah, super cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to tolerate a little ambiguity, um, mm-hmm. which, which yeah. not everybody is good at, but I've had a little training sure. with in the startup world, but, yeah. uh, yeah, it is rewarding when it comes together and, and it does feel like, um, you know, when you, when you, you can build your own house, uh, you know, it feels great to live in it and, uh, it suits you, suits you a little better. So, um, but I, I'm under no illusion that I'll ever be permanently answered either. So I'm, I'm just like mm-hmm. ready to let that well, evolve. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, one like one example of, of this that I liked, and then we'll sort of we'll wrap it up is uh, Scott Adams, uh, creator of uh, Dope. Mm-hmm. Um, I've always been a fan of his his books, and uh, uh, I think he said it's uh, it's how to f- how to fail at everything and still win big. <laughs> yep, <laughs> one of his his books, and uh, he said that you know instead of trying to be in the top one percent of one thing, it's much better to be in the top ten or fifteen percent or twenty five percent in two or more things and combine that. Mm-hmm. And that's much more specific. Right. And I mean, he said that like, he's not like, he's not the best artist, but he's pretty good. So he's like up there in terms of cartoonists and he's, he's not the funniest, <laughs> but he is pretty funny. He's funnier than most people. And yeah. the combination, the intersection of those two skills built his entire career. Uh, and yeah. he used that, he leveraged that, if you will, <laughs> to, to branch off into more. So, you know, it's a, again, it's a process of becoming that you're right. It never really finishes. I don't think, you know, like, there's nothing that I can say that, you know, that's my specific knowledge now and forever. It's always going to be, you know, expanded. Yeah. And I mean, Victor Frankl, um, mm-hmm. Holocaust survivor, Man's Search for Meaning, one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, he's, his sort of, he didn't put it in this in these terms, but his sort of specific knowledge uh, was uh, helping other people find their specific knowledge. You know, yeah. that's that's something like a need that's that needs to be filled as well. Do you have an answer for uh, for that? Who you know, search for who or what needs you the most? No, <laughs> no. Uh, I, you'll find I don't have many answers. I, I'm full of questions, but not many answers. Uh, I, I, That's what the books go, are for. Exactly right. I, I go where I'm needed. You know, yeah. you know, try to be helpful where I can. And uh, I looked. I mean, I look to what I can give as opposed to what I can take. And you know, when I when I started to do that, that's when my whole life started to change. You know, and like once, like I, I, then I got everything that I needed and now it's sort of like all bonus, you know, make it like, if you can make the, if you can help the people around you to win, I think that's so rewarding. So that's almost the same question, right? So like, you know, who or what needs you the most is, is not too dissimilar from, you know, how can I most effectively give? Right. Um, So if you, if you've answered that question, maybe, maybe you're, uh, you're better off than you think you are. Yeah. On the right track. Yeah. Wiser than I know. (laughs) Um, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up uh, now. Um, I, I want to give the last last word to you. Um, any sort of like uh, like closing thoughts that you, that you want to uh, that you want to give, and as well, um, I want you to let everyone know uh, where they can find you. Of course, online, uh, what you're working on right now. Um, uh, you've got a new book coming out. You've got a podcast, a new fund. You've got a whole lot of interesting stuff going on. So just take a few minutes. The rest is yours. <laughs> Tell us about it. Oh God, um, I don't know. Clo- closing, <laughs> go go go. <laughs> closing thought. I think. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm like very fired up about this book. Uh, Where's my flying car right now? And it's just got me like on a soapbox about how like the combination of um, continually improving technology and 
ever more effective capitalism can totally like save the world and liberate everybody. So um, I hope everybody's on board with that. And that's like a little bit of a hot topic these days, but um, it, it is an amazing book and it kind of shows how within our lifetimes, a second industrial revolution is within reach, which is absolutely beyond imagination for, for most of us. Um, but, you know, we can basically have perfect control over the material world and energy too cheap to meter. And that will really like transform the lives of our species. And that before the industrial revolution, it was very difficult to imagine that we would ever be able to live the way we can now. So um, mm-hmm. it, it is totally doable. And uh, I hope we all can sort of blow into those sails um, with, with some of our effort over the next rest of our lives. Um, so that's, that's my soapbox and, <laughs> and what I encourage and right some on. more of what I'm working on now. Um, I, I'm going to write a bunch more about that. So all, all my stuff is on ejorgensen.com. Um you know, I've got a podcast there. I got a blog there and a newsletter. Uh, I have, I, I spend way too much time on Twitter and I'm easy to, you know, sort of talk to her DM there or whatever. Um, I'm working on the next book and starting a venture fund, um, that, that we just opened up for, for investment. So if you're, if you're an early stage entrepreneur or you just want to uh, get some capital leverage and put some money to work, you can mm-hmm. find that at rolling.fun. Um, but, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's it's all on, it's all on the website. Uh, and okay. I, I, if you, if, I appreciate anybody who's made it this far for uh, mm. tolerating our our uh, self indulgent rambles, and uh, and I hope we uh, found some way to give you something worthwhile. Right on, and it's all in the show notes. So you know, it's all in the show notes, baby. That's where yeah. it begins, but that does not is that's not where it ends. Once you so once you dive into the almanac Shh. of the vault, you, it's a rabbit hole from which you might never recover. So or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I, I hope the book. Oh, 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 yes, very important. So the book, um, the, the book website is Navalmanac.com, but it is available for free. Like all the digital versions are available for free there, and the audiobook okay. is available for free on my podcast. So um Perfect. do not feel any pressure to to buy it. It's on Amazon, but like you can read the PDF or the Kindle or whatever version there. Um, and uh and we're translated into like uh, I don't know, almost 20 languages, I think, um no, are in that's progress. Cool. So uh, if, you, if you just happen to have listened to two to an hour and a half of an English podcast and you need a translation of it into a different language for a book, you can find it on evolmanac.com. <laughs> cool. Man, thanks so much, Eric. I, I really enjoyed talking to you and uh, I really appreciate you uh, stopping by High Existence Podcast. It's uh, really cool to talk to you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for reaching out. I really enjoyed this. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Right on. Cheers. 